possibly just my imagination, but I believe the world shook moments after that broadcast from Carmen, Haley, and Melanie went dark. Impossible, but I'm not so sure. Something changed. May we all hope for the better. There's no doubt of it for me, Jessica, but if you won't take my word for it, then I'll tie you into the communication feed David Burles linked us to, coming in from the Weather Bureau's monitoring station on Ellesmere Island in northern Canada. David, patch it over now. Can't tell you exactly where it's began, but we are now completely buried beneath a massive canopy of ice and snow that washed over us like a wave in the past few minutes. Our entire station shook as if the earth were tearing itself apart. Only the foresight of those who built this station to withstand almost any bombardment of nature has sustained us thus far. We cannot emphasize strongly enough that this event, whatever it is, will surely not stop in the Arctic. Pass on to all those who can still relay the message. Warn anyone still with us out there. The message repeats. This is Arnold Ischfeld at the GWB remote station in Alert Nunavut reporting live on the Global Weather Emergency Broadcast Frequency. We can't tell you exactly... Whatever happened on that ship, the Asphodel, it's clearly affected the planet in a dramatic way, and we all need to be prepared for its impact. David, can you give us any more detail about what's going on up near the pole? Alison, as you heard, a huge shockwave surged out across the station at Alert in northern Ellesmere Island in Canada only a matter of minutes ago. We have activated all monitoring links through satellite feeds and can confirm that it originated at the current location of the North Geomagnetic Pole on the very northern tip of Ellesmere, exactly where our WRET team were supposedly located when their phase transition began. But you say supposedly, David. Can you not confirm the ship was there when this event occurred? The only ones who have ever confirmed anything about that ship, Ellison, are Carmen, Haley, and Melanie. None of our monitoring systems have even detected it. And from what Graciela last reported, neither have any other systems. According to all we know, that ship does not exist. Well, then I would say a figment of our collective imaginations has just rocked the world. And we're all officially on alert status. We will continue to track the progress of this shockwave, Allison. But in the meantime, I think it is safe to assume our colleagues in alert are correct and we should all prepare for impact of one form or another. And Allison, on that note, we have Graciela Perez connecting with us from the SSAC, where she has been observing these unfolding events along with the on-site team. Graciela, what more can you tell us? Well, this event set off nearly every alarm in the center, triggering seismic, geothermal, atmospheric, and even magnetic flux sensors. So far, it is seen as an entirely anomalous, unexplained phenomenon. But it is the opinion of the various experts, scientific and military, that the equivalent of a massive bomb detonation has occurred. There are indications that prior to the blast itself, if that is what it was, a kilometers high pillar of fire rolled up from the surface of the planet and appears to have been swallowed in the upper atmosphere, as if a great conflagration on the ground had all its oxygen sucked from it, pulling it upwards into the heavens and releasing a devastating shockwave in the process, almost literally obliterating whatever disturbance at the pole had been driving our atmospheric breakdown. Because ever since that instant, that long drawn out instant, the patterns of air movement and temperature differential in that area have returned to what they should have been before any of this chaos began. As if, Vlad, time itself reverted to a moment preceding the incident that triggered our problems in the first place. Graciela, you're not really suggesting that some sort of time jump happened here. We would all be caught in a time paradox if that were the case. All of us remember everything that's happened this evening. The clock still shows almost 11 here. I know it's pretty far-fetched, and likely just the total surprise at what is being observed, but that is the most likely explanation of what we've seen over the past 10 to 15 minutes, Jessica, and I've heard it directly from the mouths of scientific personnel who are as incredulous as I. And this is not just local people. There are murmurs of this sort coming from the major operational centers we are tied into around the world. A localized self-contained time bubble centered on the event at the pole. Either that, or something else equally improbable. Because with what we are seeing, everyone is more or less at a loss. But the good news is, this is good news, as far as we can tell. 
So, Graciela, if the global experts are mystified but hopeful, I imagine that is how we should all view this, as if the hand of God intervened. On behalf of the planet, of humanity, of all living things that call this world home. I might add, Vlad, that hand of God this may have been, but if this all works out in our favor, we'll all owe the continued existence of our home and our very lives to a certain group of WRET field staff. And perhaps, if one could see the work of God's hand in any of this, one might find it present in more than one place. What we did not learn, even in our cataclysmic experience of a year ago, maybe we will be unable to ignore this time. A lesson that can only be learned through near-apocalyptic circumstance, the great flood of our day. Carmen, Haley, and Melanie, the Noahs of this century. Maybe. I would agree with you, Jessica, but we're not yet sure exactly how this incident at the pole will end. And I caution all listeners to remain vigilant until we know what's still to come. David warned that a sudden and drastic weather impact may happen much sooner than expected, and we can now confirm that the changes are already underway. Alan Golo reports from just outside the still beleaguered Universal Hollow Studios in South Sewerston. Alan, what's happening out there? Hey, listen. Although I was outside for a short time during the 2011 event last year, I have never before <coughs> experienced what I am now in terms of unpredictable drastic wind gusts or <coughs> temperature surges. <coughs> it is as though the atmosphere is being stirred by a giant hypersonic mixer and uh, <coughs> the cold low oxygen upper air is mixing in layers with the warm high oxygen air <coughs> we are meant to have. Why are you not inside, Alan, where you can get some degree of protection as this mixer effect stirs up the air? I guess, Alison, <coughs> we've taken control of the fires away from our emergency personnel. The entire studio <coughs> is an inferno, and the flames <coughs> are leaping from one building to the next so quickly, <coughs> I can barely keep ahead of them. And unfortunately, Hudson, I could not get Francesco out. He is gone. We're sorry to hear that, Alan. But now it's time for you to get yourself to safety. And I'll relay our earlier message once again on your behalf. If you're listening to this, stay inside, sheltered, until the turmoil caused by whatever happened at the pole has passed. At that point, well, we'll all know when we know. And Ellison... Even in a relatively sheltered location, challenges can still pursue you, directly or indirectly, because of what we are all going through. Our reporter G. Chotrek is checking in once again from the vicinity of the North Terminus Lifestyle Center. Jean, we hope you and those with you were able to safely escape the tunnels once those rail lines became electrified and the trains began moving again. For once, Vlad, luck seems to be with us. Whatever restored the power in those tunnels was short-lived, as the trains rolled for no more than a few minutes, and we were all able to dodge into an empty side tunnel and avoid both trains and power rails. But there were collisions during even that short time, a significant one at the lowest sub-level below North Terminus. We heard the trains hit, and there was a pretty major explosion. I suppose power was on, but the control AI did not kick in quickly enough. I am surprised there are not more rigorous built-in safety features that prevent such uncontrolled movement of automated public vehicles. I suspect there were, but all of that was probably fried like the computerized traffic flow system when the lifestyle center was struck by lightning earlier this evening. By the time the power shut down again and we all made our way to the station, there was just burning wreckage. We moved past it as quickly as we could, and have now joined in the fight to restore order up here in the center itself. It is a relief to be out of those tunnels and to be joining the dedicated emergency crews on site in their fight to restore order. For the first time in hours, I am not the only one responsible for the safety and well-being of those around me. It feels good not to be in charge. But when you needed to be, 
When those around you were panicking and did not know where to turn, you did what you had to. That is true leadership, Gene. And you have the thanks of all those you helped and all of us. Thank you, Vlad. It is never a conscious decision. Just that in a crisis, in the moment of sheer terror, there is a place inside me that can somehow remain calm, can think clearly, logically, and unaffected by what is happening around me. I could say I would rather not have this, this gift, if you can call it that, but it has served me well. What you just described, Jean, is more rare than you think, and it's the reason so many of us look up to you. We can sense that inner calm, even without the crisis to highlight it. It's what makes you a great field reporter, and the same goes for all of the WRAT field crew that risk their lives every day to bring the news to us. I'm proud to be a part of that team, just as I know you are. So get out there and do what you do. Those people at the center need you. Jessica, do not underestimate what you and the station crew bring to this. We could not reach the ears of our audience without you. But I do need to do what I can here. Please thank Melanie, Haley, and of course, Carmen for all of us when you reach them again. When is certainly the operative word, Jean. And we here in the station anticipate that moment as much as you. But although, as Alan reported, the atmospheric turmoil in Sewerston has not yet subsided, David Burrow reports that there is clear evidence now indicating a confirmed restart of the Earth's air circulation engine, so to speak. David? I decided this was important enough that the people of Sewerston should hear it as soon as we were sure. Drawing from the collective data gathered around the globe at our over 3,000 weather monitoring stations, including the one at Alert on Ellesmere Island, the Global Bureau has now confirmed that the northern atmospheric ASL circulation, which had been effectively shut down over the past hours, has now been restored. This means that both the lower and upper atmospheric air movement should more or less return to normal over the coming hour or two, and although there will be some significant unpredictability in air mass and weather behavior during the transition period, as Ellen Angola reported earlier, this will soon pass. The tropopause, which had been eliminated for a period of several hours, has now reformed. Our ground level oxygen levels will restabilize to something close to normal, as will temperatures. The crisis, the planet's meteorological peril, is over, at least for the present. I know there are millions of listeners out there who will be more than a little relieved to hear you confirm this, David. And I know also that many very critical thoughts will now begin turning to the instigators of this near-cataclysmic disaster, to bringing them to justice, and to making sure such reckless and unthinking stupidity never brings the world so close to its ultimate end again. Well said, Jessica. But before their minds turn to either vengeance or prevention, I guarantee most of those listeners will want to hear from our polar team. We're overjoyed to report that now on the line with us from somewhere in the Arctic, on an official comm link, is WRIT traffic reporter Haley Klassen. Haley, we've never been so happy to hear your voice. Alison, for a while, I will admit we were not so sure you would ever hear from us again. Nobody on board the Asphodel has any recollection of what happened once the ship initiated its extended phasing transition from the phase state to the normal world. For me it was as if time stopped, all movement and sound ceased, the ship around me frozen, silent and still. Then my senses shut down and I believe I lost consciousness. When I recovered I was still standing exactly where I had been, as were all the others on the bridge. We had no real idea how much time had passed, but the ship's sensors have since reported that, upon initiation of the transition, we jumped back in time somehow, to a moment earlier this evening, and that as we slowly faced across to our own normal state, the world we know, time accelerated forward for us, so that when we regained our senses, the transition was complete, and we were exactly where and when we should be. Over the north coast of Ellesmere Island, the location of the North Geomagnetic Pole, only the crew we were meant to connect with, the, the instigators, the perpetrators, call them what you will, of this global atmospheric crisis, were nowhere to be found. Beneath us, where they should have been, nothing but a vast kilometer-wide crater, perhaps 300 meters deep, scorched and blackened. 
and gentle snow falling from a wintry sky. The ship's transition must have obliterated the area and those causing the heat at the pole along with it. Energy and matter roaring through the rift, the portal that the ship created between worlds, the phase world and our world. Worlds collide, pillars of heavenly fire. Francesco had it right. Ellison, the captain has taken charge of conducting tests of the area to determine exactly what happened, but what you are describing sounds as plausible as any. He has also guaranteed us that he will ensure the technology for this vessel, which has been in part responsible for the events tonight, will be made publicly available, with or without the agreement of his immediate command structure. As for those activists here at the Pole, suffice to say that the very well organized and very well funded fanatics who initiated our near extinction are no more. But that does not mean their friends, their compatriots who were not on site, will cease their efforts at helping the world meet its doom. The Apostles do not give up easily. We might have known the Apostles of the Apocalypse would re-emerge to make yet another attempt to settle this planet's fate once and for all. But thanks to your team, that ultimate disaster has been averted, and the world will be all the more vigilant in watching for their next action. Haley, are you all still on that ship? Are Melanie and Carmen with you up there? I will pass you to Melanie, and she can explain how things stand. Alison, we are all here but it appears that Carmen's efforts to link us to you throughout the hospital's progress in getting to the pole and doing what it did had a less than positive impact on her. She never regained consciousness after the transition and we're here with her at the ship's sick bay. Melanie, I assume the ship's medical team is doing everything they can to revive her. What do you think caused her to be unable to recover? From what I can gather, while this ship is in its alternate phase state, it should be impossible for it to communicate to the normal world. Yet Carmen was able to forge a link. We believe she was part of that conduit and it took a physical toll. Not only that, she delivered a complete plan to resolve the world's meteorological crisis to the captain and persuaded him to implement it. Nobody advised her on what plan might work and she's hardly an expert in physics. How she obtained the details of what needed to be done your guess is as good as mine, but it was not through any ordinary channel. As Francesco said, the gods descend. We've always credited Carmen with unequaled intuition, but this feels more like divine inspiration. I'm glad you and Haley are there with her. If there's a likelihood of her recovering, having you both there will certainly improve the odds. And Melanie, I am sending you a private audio message, which I would like you to play for Carmen, for her ears only if you wouldn't mind playing it for her now. Of course, Vlad. Distressing to have achieved what we have and to see her like this. All right, got it. I'm playing it for her now. Vlad, Vlad, what did you send her? She's, she's coming round. Can you put her on, Melanie? There are a lot of people here who would like to hear her voice. I am here, Vlad. But you are wrong. I did not save the world. We all did. This is WRAT, AM 1700. The Rat. It is 11 o'clock on WRAT. I'm Carmen Electra. We have all been given another chance. And this is the first hour of your new life.